some more star from the projections in the middle space, or more generally from the projection lattice of the phenomenon as well. Um, the reason is that uh, we have the spectral theorem which can be read in a way that to each proposition of the kind A is in delta that corresponds some projection E which lies in the projection lattice of the phenomenon. Is it possible to draw a, a simple projection that, that is just to visualize visual it? Um, well, for two dimensional Hilbert's, Hilbert space, it's just all the lines for the origin. This is, this is the picture, if you like. And for three oh. um, dimensions, you simply take all the closed subspaces. And in the final dimensions, all the subspaces of, of um, the vector space. Yeah. This is a um, visualization for this. Okay. Um, and this is the part, simply the fact that uh, two propositions that correspond um, such projections um, is the part of quantum logic that we want to keep. And then comes the thing I uh, promised to Basil at uh, breakfast. This is uh, Chris Coyne, and he's very fond of Heidegger. And so there's, there's some mapping that I want to discuss now. He calls this Daseinization. There's this nice German word, Dasein. Which I, Heidegger also used in hyphens usually, and, and this means read it very, very literally, and um, it means being there um, or existence. And of course, what we want to do is to relate projection P to all the contexts. We, the, well, the, the, the P will be contained in some of these um, subalgebras, but it will not be contained in all of them. So we'll have to do something. Um, for those words uh, not contained in and we define some mapping delta going from the projections um, of the phenomenon algebra to this yes well to, uh, to do the collection of all the projection lattices of these billion subalgebras sending p to p v and p v is simply defined in the following way take the infinite of over, over all the q and p of v such that uh, q is greater than or equal to p. So you approximate p as closely as possible from above uh, with a projection in, in each of these abelian subalgebra in this context v. And if we've done so, then we also have to find the subset of the Gelfand spectrum sigma v for each v. Yeah, well, um, simply um, PV goes to all the uh, pure states that send um, PV to 1. Simply because these are multiplicative states, uh, each projection gets sent either to 0 or to 1. And um, we simply pick all those um, omega that uh, send PV to 1. And then it can be shown, it's quite easy to see that we get um, a sub-object of this pre we get a sub pre of sigma. Sigma was the collection of, of the whole Gelfand spectrum. Now in each Gelfand spectrum we have a certain subset and these subsets fit together nicely with its restrictions and this means we get um, a sub-object of sigma. So this docentization map thrown things into existence, as Chris likes to say, in a sense a projection to a sub-object of the spectral pre -sheet. Okay. And this is, by the way, something that, which is new. The, the, the stuff before basically was containing one what he did with uh, Butterfield. Um, no, I'm going back. What we have not used up to now, but, but of course is at the heart of the whole thing, that um, this pre shift category that we are not, um, is a top loss, it's a special type of category. And um, maybe I should have said a little more of this stuff, but um, I decided not to give a detailed definition of what a top loss is because there's no technical way to do that. Um, and uh, well, I think it's enough to say that a top loss is a Category that is similar to set, the, the category of sets and then the functions we use sets in some sense. Specifically, what we have in set, um, we can take disjoint unions, we can take the Cartesian product of sets, 
we have exponentiation, and this would mean taking um, s to the t, which would be the set of all functions from t to s. And in the top of we have abstract versions of this, category versions of all that, and there they are called co-limits, limits, and exponentials. Well, this is some stuff, as Paul would say, where you take a book and you get frustrated the first time you read it, you get frustrated the second time you read it, but uh, you have to chew through this a little bit, but uh, you can generalize all this um, very much and then you get this. And, but the most important thing probably at top us is the so-called sub-object classifier, and it's also the hardest to explain. Um, it's a special object in the category that generalizes somehow the set um, 0, 1, like in, in, the, in set, um, and 0, 1, of course, are truth values, so they're usually interpreted as truth values, and I'll show diagrams to make this a little clearer. Um, and of course, set is uh, a topless to, um, but what do we mean by the sub-object classifier? Well, this is, this is the textbook definition, but I um, can say a little more on that. In the category C, with final limits, the sub-object classifier is a monic. So actually, it's not only this omega, usually I call omega the, the sub-object classifier, but in fact, um, the whole uh, right side of the diagram is called the sub-object classifier. We do this uh, uh, very carefully. And uh, this is a monic. A monic is something uh, which generalizes uh, an injective function to, to categories. True, going from the terminal object, so we do need a terminal object in the category, which is always denoted by 1, to omega, such that to every monic, um, this is m here, s of x, there is unique morphism phi, uh, which uh, with a given monic forms a pullback diagram. A lot of abstract stuff. What does it mean, basically? Let's think about that in, in the category of sets. Well, this is some subset of x. This is how we want to think about it for the moment. M simply is the inclusion, which is an injection, clearly. Um, omega here simply is the two point set. And this diagram being a pullback, um, I don't, won't explain this uh, really, means um, that this phi below here simply is the characteristic function of the subset S lying in x. So what we want to generalize is this notion of um, characteristic function. Well, characteristic, characteristic function simply says for each point in x, um, does it line s or doesn't it line s? So there, there, we are back to this yes-no logic. There are two possibilities. And in a topos, this is generalized. This can be a larger logic in some sense, we should not think that it's simply a multi-value logic because this need not be said, this is some object in the category. And the, the important thing is what, what's going on between this corner of the diagram and this corner, so to say. This, um, this phi is generalized, the notion of um, the characteristic function is generalized by the sub-object classifier. Um, okay, and it's quite hard to get some, some intuition how this works, but maybe it becomes a little clearer and, and when we go back to our special case. Um, <coughs> well, what can be shown generally, and for me only need a very special case, is that a sub-object classifier gives an internal logic to the topos. The topos comes equipped with an internal logic. And the important result that we use is that um, the, sub, the set of sub-objects of sigma forms a height in integral. Of course, this is only a very special case of what uh, goes on in, in, in topos. Um, but, but this is the part of uh, topos logic that we want to use. Um, and the hiding edge, we also had this today already. This is a distributive, so we, um, this is the important thing. Distributive pseudo-complement lattice in which the law of excluded is pretty much hold it. So I'll try to make this clear here. First of all, this means we can get long maybe breakfast, which is a good thing. Um, but um, what's different uh, from what one might expect uh, from, from everyday logic, from Boolean logic, is that the law of excluded middle doesn't need to hold. So A or not, uh, E or not E generally is not the identity or the maximal element in the um, 
adding algebra, it can be smaller. This is equivalent to uh, 